the Centre for Sustainable for Alternative Technology, for uh, which is a really uh, interesting um, research place in, in Wales that is doing a lot of really interesting research on alternative technologies. Um, <coughs> And Freya is going to talk about, well, I'll let her tell you. But thanks a lot for coming, Freya, and back to us. No, thank you. Show. Um, uh, can everybody, if you've not signed your name on the register, um, on the register, please do that before you leave. Um, or, okay, I'm going to pass it down now. What's the register for? Just fire safety, because it's, right. um, it's oh, out of hours. Thank you. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Uh, as you've said, I'm Freya, and I come from Mohantlet in Mid Wales. It took me two weeks to learn how to say it when I moved there, so I'm doing quite well. Um, thank you very much for letting me come and speak to you today um, about the work that the Centre for Alternative Technology has been doing on a zero carbon Britain, um, which is a really interesting project. Um, and I'm going to basically give you a brief run through of this. So um, it's going to be quite quick, it's going to be quite brutal. Um, if you have any questions, um, there'll be a QA at the end. We were going to have um, one of the researchers on Skype um, to do, if you wanted to ask sort of quite technical questions. I wasn't involved in the research, I didn't come from a technical background, Neil stopped smirking at me. Um, but I am part of the communications team at CAT, um, so I thought I'd come and communicate what we're trying to achieve here to lots of lovely, like-minded people. So thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with a bit of history about CAT. Has anyone heard of the Centre for Alternative Technology? Yep. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. Anyone been there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, that's really good. Well, I'm still going to talk through the history of it anyway. Sorry. I'm um, going to look at uh, the context where the Zero Carbon Britain, Britain project has come from, kind of the history of it. Um, think about the aims of the project, what we were trying to achieve with it, and, and then go through the key, three key sections, which was power down, power up, and land use. Um, and then talk a little bit about what lies ahead. Um, so. The Centre for Alternative Technology um, was founded, depending on who you talk to, in 1973, 74 or 75. Um, and the reason for that is because a group of crazy idealists, or hippies as they might have been called, um, bought an abandoned slate quarry in 1973, moved up there in February and started trying to live a sustainable life. Um, this is discussions with um, candlelight in the very early years. Um, people thought they were absolutely crazy. I think quite a few of them were. Um, and they basically felt that we were reaching a kind of a critical point in terms of our energy usage. And they felt that we needed to look into an alternative strategy, hence the Centre for Alternative Technology. So in the 70s, they were building wind turbines, they were building solar panels, um, they were composting, they were using compost toilets. Um, and CAT became known as the shit and wind place to a lot of people in the local area. Um, in, uh, sorry, but uh, obviously we've grown since then. Um, this is the site, sort of as it looks now, kind of getting into autumn slash winter. Um, and over the years, CAT has expanded. So the visitor centre opened in 1975. Um, we now do postgraduate programmes and sustainable courses. Um, we do educational visits for primary school children all the way up to, through to university level. We publish books, um, we go to events, um, and of course we do the Zero Carbon Britain project. Um, that's us doing all of those things. Um, Kat has always had a real emphasis on practical, hands-on things that people can be doing, and always maintaining a really kind of positive view of the future. Um, and that is really what Zero Carbon Britain comes down to. It's looking at what we can technically, physically achieve um, to create the future that we want to see. So in terms of context, um, I'm not going to go into this in great detail because I'm sure that a lot of you know what the situation is currently, um, especially in, in line with the new IPCC report. Um, but what we are seeing today is new norms. We're seeing new norms in temperature, um, oceans are becoming more and more acidic, um, and we're seeing a loss of Arctic sea ice every year. But we're coming to accept these things as normal. And um, if we look at 1984 for sea ice and then look at what we expect to see you know, we call it a slight growth in 2012, despite the trend saying that it's constantly decreasing. Um, you can see that we are actually learning to adapt to a very difficult situation that actually we shouldn't really be feeling too comfortable with. Um, we're seeing the extremes, we're seeing heat waves, we're seeing droughts, we're seeing floods. 
and obviously that's um, impacting some parts of the world more than us, um, but it will also impact us and it is impacting us right now. And there's more to come. And there's more that's expected, but there's also a lot that's unexpected. Um, and we need to think very seriously about how we're going to deal with these issues from now <coughs> into the future. And I'm sure that all of you are very involved in doing that. <laughs> um, you'll probably know the planetary boundaries um, diagram, um, but obviously this is, this is the state that we're in, and this is from um, 2009 slash 10. Um, but the, the grey circle is the, sort of the, the planetary boundaries that we should be within, um, and this is where we're currently at. So the only thing that's going, is I've got a downward trend, is the ozone depletion. Everything else is accelerating quite drastically out, and this is what we need to try and pull back in. Um, so in 1977, um, depending on you know, how long ago, maybe about three, four, five years after CAT was founded, um, this was produced, an alternative energy strategy for the United Kingdom. And this was bound up and it was sent down to the UK <coughs> government. And it talked about what we needed to do um, to actually reduce the amount of energy that we were consuming. You probably can't read this little bit here, um, but it says the fall in energy input arises because of more effective energy utilization and because uh, for the renewable energy sources. Hmm. Um, but you know, Kat was talking about something um, that the government were just not prepared to listen to. And actually, Kat was not far off with its trends of high growth, um, not low growth. And that's what the Department of Energy was estimating. Because this was before we tapped into um, North Sea gas. This was, um, you know, we were looking at an energy revolution that was going to make us completely um, free of any external energy sources. You know, we were going to produce our own energy and everything was going to be fine. Um, obviously, things have changed quite a bit since then. Um, so in 2007, Zero Carbon Britain was created um, to sort of follow on from what CAT had done previously um, and to look at an alternative energy strategy. Um, that continued in 2010 with the launch of Zero Carbon Britain 2030. This was um, basically giving us a sort of a deadline. It was looking at what we can achieve um, in 20 years. And it was sort of saying, we need to start now, and we're giving ourselves this incredibly short time frame, and we're going to get there. Um, but then this year, we have brought out Zero Carbon Britain Rethinking the Future. And this is because the previous report, it gave a really good general overview. Um, but there were questions. People were saying, well, what would you do with this? What would you do with that? Um, and so the researchers have spent past year um, working through all of the science to make sure that what we're saying to people um, is completely based on scientific fact. Um, we've done all the research, we've done all the um, modelling to show that we can power our future 100% by renewable energy and by carbon neutral sources. Um, so that's sort of where we're at now, as it is. Um, if we look at the historical data and look where we'll go forwards, um, as you can see, business as usual is leading us to about a three and a half degree rise, and that's the kind of mean temperature, so it could be more could be less, but <laughs> maybe not. Um, and our current emission pledges don't currently get us anywhere near the sort of two degrees limit that the UN has set on climate change. Um, and so, once again, this is where Zero Carbon Britain comes in, because we want to close what we call the yawning chasm, um, which is where what happens when pol politicians and sort of policies come into play and they say, right, Here's this you know, really large abstract concept, what are we going to do about it? We instead look at what we have, we look at the technology that we're currently using, and we say, right, what do we need to do with this technology to get us to that point where we're staying below two degrees and we're completely um, emissions free in the UK? Um, and so we approach it from the physical side rather than looking at it from the political side. Um, Having said that, we launched it in Parliament <laughs> in July this year, so that's us. Um, the banner basically says, science says we must, technology says we can, time to say we will. Um, because it's true, we have got 95% <coughs> of the world's scientists, and pretty much all of the credible ones, saying that we need to do something about climate change. We've got the technology, you know, we've got incredibly efficient wind turbines now, we've got huge opportunities in the UK for our future energy sources. Um, all we need now is that kind of political will. We need people standing up and saying, this is what we need to do about it. 
So key points, um, we use only currently available technology. We're not looking for silver bullets in the future. There are some things that could help us, definitely, um, if they were invented in the future or they're currently in that sort of testing phase, but we don't rely on them. We've shown that we can get there without them. Um, we maintain a decent standard of living. Um, people get quite scared, I think, when I talk to them about climate change, because they think that you're going to ask them to sort of go move back into a mud hut and not have a phone and, you know, be a hunter-gatherer or something again. And that's not what we're looking at here. Um, we did think quite carefully about what people want and what people are used to in this day and age. Um, and we have made adjustments and there will be some changes that need to be made. But on the whole, we live as we do now. Um, we want to support biodiversity. Um, that's a huge problem at the moment is um, a loss of biodiversity, not just in this country but around the world. Um, and so that was a key factor with us as well. Adaptation and resilience. Things are going to change. We've already set a course that we are going to be following. Even if we cut emissions tomorrow, there will still be changes due to the number of greenhouse gases currently in the atmosphere. Um, so learning how to adapt to that um, and to become more resilient in our towns and our countries is very important. Um, costs and the benefits. Um, we don't model the economics for zero carbon <coughs> if we wanted to approach it from this technological side. Um, but we did want to sort of have a think about that, think about what the benefits would be to the economy, um, how many jobs would be produced, um, but also think beyond the monetary and think what we would gain from moving towards a zero carbon Britain. Um, changes that last. We weren't looking for quick fixes to get us down to that. We're thinking about a long term um, goal, but one that can be implemented very quickly. We also include certain carbon emissions. Um, so this is things that the current Kyoto Protocol doesn't um, include with our, um, our Climate Change Act target for 2050. Um, so we include aviation and we also include shipping um, for our products. We don't include um, countries that perhaps grow food for us that then gets exported to us, and I'll explain why um, a little bit later. Um, but most importantly, really, for this is that um, Zero Carbon Britain's a dialogue, it's an open conversation. Um, we are not saying, right, here you go, this is it, this is what you must do and there must be no alterations. We wanted to show that this is technically possible, but we also want people to engage with it and say, oh, what if we did this instead of that? Um, you know, maybe we could take this and we could use that bit and we could model something slightly different. We want that, we really want people to get involved and it's not just one route, there are lots of different options to bring together. Um, so this is where we are at the moment. As you can see, the climate change app in 2050 going down to 20% of our emissions, so cutting, yeah, cutting by 80%. Um, and this is what Zero Carbon Britain is saying we can do. Um, as you can see, that's quite a big change. Um, the way our model goes, we sort of continue to emit at current levels until 2015, and from there it's a steadily de steady decrease in our emissions um, to 2030. Again, 2030 is an arbitrary date, we're not saying it has to be done by then, but if we want to avoid really critical, serious climate change, that is the kind of date that we should be working towards. So ZTV shows that UK greenhouse gas emissions can be reduced to net zero. Um, we don't rely on future technology and we keep that same quality of life. Um, two things that we were really looking at in this report, can we keep the lights on? Because that's something that people always say to us, if you're using renewable technology and um, you've got fluctuations, you can't rely on it, you don't have base load power, what do you do about that? So that was one of the things that we were looking to prove. Um, and also the food and diet section is really important and we wanted to look at how we can be healthier in a zero carbon Britain. Okay, so this is where we are at um, and this is when all the infographics come in and there's a lot of information. You probably won't be able to take it all in, um, but you can read the report online, you can buy a copy from our shop. I've got some reports in short that I can give to you guys afterwards, um, so just let it all flow over you. Um, so where we are currently is at about um, 650 megatons of CO2 um, emitted every year um, in the UK. And as you can see, a huge part of that is our energy. 82% is our energy for industry, it's for our houses, our electricity. Um, our transport. Then we've got non-energy. This is things like industrial processes. This is waste. Um, and then we've also got land use. Um, but as you can see, land use, we also have um, land use that captures carbon as well. 
Um, and that's going to be a really key part in getting our emissions down to zero, because this is what zero carbon emission looks like. So as you can see, we've brought our energy uses way, way down, so it's just sort of aviation effects that are left. Some non-energy, some land use, but there's a lot more carbon capture happening as well. Okay, so as I said before, power down, power up, and land use. <coughs> so we'll start with the power down section, because that's what will happen first. Um, this is what the UK energy currently looks like. Um, as you can see, some coal, a lot of oil, a lot of gas, of which there's quite a significant amount lost during the process um, of bringing it to us in the power stations. Um, and then of what's left, that's about 1,750 terawatt hours per year. Um, and that is the breakdown of where it ends up. Um, so quite a significant chunk into our buildings, heating our hot water, even more than that into our transport. Um, and still a fair chunk into our buildings and also into our industry. Um, what we say is that we can reduce um, our energy demand by 60% in these areas in ZCB. Um, but that doesn't happen across the board. Certain changes can be quite drastic in, other, in some areas and they can be less in others. Um, so if we look at industry first, as you can see, industry was the sort of yellow, the orange bit. Um, industry actually doesn't change that much in the zero carbon Britain scenario um, and that's because we predict in 20, by 2030 population will have increased um, but also we will have hopefully returned to sort of 2007 levels of industry pre-recession um, but to kind of mitigate those we have greater efficiency in the way that we use our industrial processes. Um, so in ZCB um, we have a lot more, we have a bit more electricity but we're also looking at synthetic biogas biomass and synthetic liquid fuel um, and the synthetic fuels and gases are carbon neutral and I'll talk through that process of how we get there um, a bit later on. Um, in buildings again we're reducing quite significantly and we're also completely changing the makeup of the way that we heat our homes. Um, we've got a lot of ambient heat so this is things like ground source heat pumps um, and air source heat pumps which are using renewable technology so renewable energy um, to create the electricity and then um, that's the way we get to the carbon neutral side of them rather than using um, electricity that's generated from fossil fuels. Um, and again, electricity, um, a bit of solar thermal, geothermal, and again, the synthetic gas or biogas as well. <coughs> um, and the reason we can get such large reductions um, in the heating is the fact that UK's housing stock is absolutely abysmal. You guys live in Leeds, um, no doubt you know this. I used to spend a lot of time in the library when I was here rather than actually in my home because it was so cold. Um, and talking from a sort of you know, purely technical, what is physically possible perspective, um, if we took an average UK home that may, take, uses maybe 10,000 kilowatt hours per year to heat, we insulated it really, really well, and we reduced all the drafts and the air leak, which made it really airtight. Um, and then we introduced smart controls so, you know, your fridge comes on only when you need it to, or, you know, you turn down the lights in one section when you're using them, you reduce the amount of heat that you're using in your home at certain points of the year, you can actually reduce how much your house needs to heat itself up to about 4,000 kilowatt hours per year. Um, this might not be the economic way to go. Um, it would probably be quite expensive to do this to all of the UK's housing stock. Um, but again, we're looking at what is technically possible, and we're also thinking, a lot of the houses in the future, all of them, will be built to passive house standard or equivalent. Um, and so you could also reuse um, some of the old materials and build new homes with them as well. So you're kind of recycling that. Um, transport, pretty huge change. Um, as you can see, it's basically pretty much all oil. Um, but we are making a lot of changes across the board in transport. Um, but one of the main ones, to be honest, um, is the amount that we transport. We are asking people to travel a bit less in ZTB. Um, it's about 15%. It's not a huge, massive reduction. Um, and we do keep flying <coughs> in it because that is quite an important part of modern life. Um, but from here, if we look at uh, ones aside from aviation, um, as you can see, the amount of people use that car is reduced. Um, and that can be measures such as encouraging people to live near where they work. Um, it could be teleconferencing rather than travelling for meetings, and also car sharing. So it's things that people are already thinking about in everyday life, it's just taking it a little bit further. Um, but then of course public transport is increased, so we've got a lot more people travelling by train and by bus. 
um, and also people cycling and people walking more. Um, and so that is the sort of reduction side of things. Um, and then also the efficiency. We're using a lot more electricity in the way that we get around. It's sort of electricity and, um, and synthetic liquid fuels. Um, and so we can again use an electricity grid um, in order to let people get around still and not sort of be stuck at home all the time. Um, that was the sort of power downside on the energy side. Um, we'll go back to energy again to show how we power up using renewables. Um, but before then, I just wanted to talk really briefly about the 8% um, from non-energy emissions. So as I said before, this is industrial processes, this is waste. Um, and as you can see from the flow diagram, you know, some of it's recycled, um, a lot of it goes to landfill, a lot of it goes to other, I don't actually know what other is. Um, but these are some of the things we've talked about um, that can bring down the way that we, um, uh, the emissions from this side of things. Um, and we can reduce it, I think it's by 61%. Um, so we end up yeah, with 21 megatons of CO2 per year, which is 61% less than what we used in 2010. Um, those are just some of the things that are mentioned in that chapter of the book um, that I, I personally find the sort of power-up section a bit more interesting. So I just thought I'd throw that at you um, and then move on. Um, so as we said, 60% reduction. Um, it's a lot to go through, so we just wow. Um, and so where do we get the remaining 40% from? Well, as you probably can guess, it's from renewable energy and carbon neutral fuel sources. So powering up, um, this is what we used in 2010, um, and this is what we will use in our zero carbon Britain scenario. So as you can see, um, a lot of electricity um, coming from wave and tidal, sorry, from wind power, um, also wave, wave and tidal, and then we've got biomass in there, um, ambient heat, and a couple of other ones to kind of bring up the mix, but 50% of our energy will come from wind power. Um, that is basically the power-up section of ZCV, um, <laughs> which is again quite a, uh, a lot to take in, but this is what a year's worth of research essentially boiled down to. Um, and so as you can see, we've got a lot of wind, but we've got other renewables and some biomass in there. Um, we'll go into more detail about the conversion processes when I talk about land use, um, but you can see the heat pumps going in for our heating, um, and then also industry and transport as well. Um, the wind, uh, so wind, this is a wind diagram of the UK. As you can see, we are amazingly well placed um, for wind turbines um, out, you know, offshore wind turbines. Um, and so uh, this was our key question with the power-up section, is can we keep the lights on? Um, and the way that um, Toby Kellner, who was our main energy, energy modeler on this section, did the research is he looked at 10 years worth of hourly wind speed data and also sort of um, solar panel data as well. So from the 1st of January 2002 to the 31st of December 2011, he took every single one of those 87,648 hours um, and he applied the ZCB model to it and he looked at how um, our demand um, could match what we were actually producing. Um, and did it work? Well, this is what he did. So as you can see, this is just a sample of um, wind turbines that are currently out in the Bristol Channel and in the Dogger Bank. This is the kind of data he was getting. And then he modelled it. Oops, sorry. So that was what we were looking at, sort of how many wind turbines would it take. Probably wouldn't take as many as that, but it, we are talking quite a lot of offshore wind. Um, then he compared um, how those wind turbines, those solar panels would do for each one of those hours. And um, that was the electricity supply. That's an average week and the way that the electricity would be generated by that model. You then compare that to the electricity demand that we had over that same week, and then you see if they match up, and they don't. Um, because wind doesn't blow when you want it to, the sun doesn't shine when you may, might need it to the most. Um, but as you can see, we do have occasions when we actually are way, way over what we need. Um, and so what Toby then did was he was looking uh, at what we can do with that excess and how we can use that to ensure that we can always meet our demand at different points of the year. Um, he always says the 21st of December 2010 at 8 in the morning was the worst hour for the model because it was that really, really cold winter that we had. 
So it was still quite dark um, and it was completely still, completely calm, but we went down to about minus 17 degrees. You know, you can't power just with your actual renewables, so you need to sort of think about how um, you are going to create backup power. <coughs> and so this is what we're doing here, is we're taking that surplus electricity um, using electrolysis um, and then the fischer tropsch process and the Sabathia process are two ways of c creating synthetic fuel and synthetic gas. The Sabathia process creates a synthetic gas, um, which can then be stored as we currently store gas in the national grid. Um, and the fischer tropsch the FT process there, is creating synthetic liquid fuels that can then be used um, to power large vehicles that couldn't be run using electricity. And as you can see, that uses biomass as well um, to create that to create the um, CO2 that then goes into creating its um, methane, its CH4, um, that is chemically identical to the natural gas that we use today, um, but it is coming from carbon neutral sources because of the way that we generate the hydrogen and because we're using locally grown biomass. So um, what would then happen with um, the synthetic gas is that we would be able to put aside something like 10, 24 terawatt hours per year, which would then be able to use at times when the supply can't meet demand. And 82% of the time of our model, we would have been able to match um, the demand, but it's on those, those occasions when we can't meet that remaining 18% that's really key. Um, and by having that backup means that we can actually keep the lights on, we can keep ourselves heated throughout the year using renewable technology and carbon neutral sources. Um, so that's the power up phase. The next phase is land use, um, which is a really integral part because as you've seen, I've talked quite a bit about biomass and the part of that, the role of that plays. Um, but also, it also leads into food and diets and carbon capture as well. Um, these are the world agricultural greenhouse gas emissions compared to the UK agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. Um, not as large portion attributable to livestock as in the world, um, but still quite a staggeringly large amount. And we're talking about 10% of total UK emissions here. Um, so it is a really big deal and it's something we need to look at. Um, what is really hard with the land use side of things is that you're looking at nitrous oxide from the soils, you're looking at manure, you're looking at methane um, from, land, from animals. Um, and those are really difficult things to kind of bring down to net zero. You know, the renewable technology, people have been looking at that for years. We've been looking at that. We can create that model. But actually bringing down um, the land use emissions is a really, really challenging part of the model. So we had two people <coughs> working on that. Um, one was a, a, a nutritionist. She was looking at the diet side of things. And we also had a, a land use specialist. Um, and this is what land use looks like in the UK today. Um, so as you can see, the pink is grassland for livestock. Um, so a huge amount um, of our land is spent feeding our animals. Um, 65 to 75% of our land, 70% is food production, um, but we also import 42% of what we eat. 85% um, of that land is for livestock, and we've only got 12% of our land is forested compared to the European average of 37 so up in the top right corner there is the harvested forest and the unharvested. Um, and this is also really key here as well. This is the um, unmanaged or conserved. This is our national parks. Um, and they're really key because as it currently stands, they are they're the areas that are conserving carbon. Um, and food for us, little orange bit there, um, which is, again, not a huge amount because you've got the yellow, which is food for livestock. So there's a lot of our land is being um, given over to raising Food, you know, raising animals for us to eat. Um, this is land use in zero carbon Britain. Um, so we've massively reduced the amount of grassland for livestock because we've also massively reduced our consumption of meat. Um, not completely though, um, and it's not actually as bad as some people might think. Um, we've increased the unmanaged or the um, conserved areas, um, and that includes restoring our peatland as well. Um, because that's a brilliant way of capturing carbon. Um, we've got our fuel and energy side, um, but we've also got enough land um, for food to feed ourselves. Um, so if I go through those three sections, um, so this is the current UK diet um, on the outside. On the inside is what the government recommends we should eat. Oops, sorry. 
Um, so as you can see, that's quite significantly different. Um, the HFSS is high in saturated fat, salts and